Welcome to a new day. In many ways, it may seem much like yesterday, but the reality is that your world is changing in important, meaningful ways all the time. Some of these changes are so slight you might not notice them. Your phone, silently, imperceptibly, might install an update overnight that makes it run just a little bit better. And some changes are so significant that they're transforming whole industries. The next time you need surgery, a robot may perform many of the necessary steps. These changes are all part of the fourth industrial revolution, also known as 4IR or Industry 4.0. This is an era defined by radical transformation, by challenges and opportunities, and by risks and rewards. It's changing who we are, how we live and work, how we relate to one another, and how we imagine the future. Although 4IR is not without its perils and pitfalls, there is much more to gain than to lose. If we manage it well, 4IR could help us create a better, smarter, safer, cleaner, and fairer world for everyone. I spoke to Professor Chilizi Marwala, Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg and 4IR Guru, about this. No, thank you very much for uh, interviewing me. Uh, I must also confess that uh, I also attended the National Science Week many, many, many years ago, uh, almost uh, 30 years ago. And uh, during that time, uh, the issue of technology was obviously very, very important, but everybody thought superconductivity is going to change the world. Mm. But now we know that the fourth industrial revolution is changing the world. Now, what is this thing called the fourth industrial revolution? It's basically an era where technology is becoming intelligent and therefore it is able to do the sort of things that are done by human beings. Uh, consequently, uh, the workplaces where uh, human beings are, are an important factor are going to be replaced by intelligent machines and it is already happening. If you go to uh, what is happening at South African breweries, if you go to what is happening in our motor industry, you realize that uh, it is at best human and machine interface. If you go to some of our call centers uh, for our large companies in South Africa, you realize that chat boxes are replacing human beings, you know. So uh, the first thing that uh, the fourth industrial revolution is doing, it is uh, removing or reducing the activity of human beings in production. The second thing is that uh, uh, it is actually changing our very identity. Uh, you know, uh, for example, we know that uh, many companies that have come as a result of the fourth industrial revolution, such as Uber, such as uh, uh, Facebook, uh, take huge amounts of data from us. Now, what does it mean for us? What does it mean for our freedoms? Uh, what does it mean for our security? What does it mean for our identity? You know, if we are also becoming uh, human machine system because now you have wearable clothes uh, that uh, are taking all sorts of data from you uh, for health reasons for example uh, and also for marketing reasons you know uh, it changes the very nature of our identity of course as its name suggests the fourth industrial revolution was preceded by three other industrial revolutions let's take a look at what each of these held the first industrial revolution took place roughly between 1760 and 1840 and saw the introduction of new mechanized manufacturing processes in Europe and the United States. Items that were once made by hand could now be made by machines thanks to the increased use of iron and steel, as well as better energy sources. The era's newly established factories were using coal and steam in their production processes for the first time. As the first industrial revolution began to wind down, the second industrial revolution started to gain momentum. Between the late 19th and early 20th centuries, manufacturing and production technology advanced and telegraph and railway systems, in particular, grew exponentially. Ideas and people could now move easier and faster than ever and the urbanization experienced under the first industrial revolution ushered in a new era of globalization in the second. 
By the time the third industrial revolution came about in the latter half of the 20th century, the world was leaving mechanical and analog technology behind and replacing it with something we're all familiar with, digital technology. Computers, microprocessors, digital cellular phones and the internet all came into existence during this time, transforming, yet again, the way populations around the globe live and work. While the fourth industrial revolution is in many ways a progression of everything that has come before, it is also an entirely different phenomenon. Its speed, scope and impact are unlike anything we've seen before. And that's saying something. And while its predecessors introduced innovations that contributed to the world's technological, socio-economic and cultural development, 4IR has gone so far as to blur the boundaries between worlds. In truly unprecedented ways, our physical, digital and biological worlds have become one under 4IR. And that's scaring a lot of people. And um, it's something that's just come so quickly because we've had so many industrial revolutions that have come before the fourth industrial revolution. And um, can, you, can you like tell us what the difference between the fourth industrial revolution is from those that um, preceded? Well, I mean, the first industrial revolution was uh, when human beings discovered the uh, steam engine. And the uh, steam engine uh, uh, became a revolutionary idea uh, and technology. Uh, we all of a sudden uh, were able to build trains that are able to trans uh, transport goods and services and people over uh, long distances. But those steam engines used to use coal. Uh, coal will be burned and it will be translated into steam and that steam energy was used to to move stuff you know uh, and then of course it was used in production uh, and when it was used in production and this was in England that is where it happened mm. um, many people did not like it uh, in fact there was a group of people called the Luddites who tried to actually stop the first industrial revolution but this did not succeed mm. and uh, the world marched on then the second industrial revolution is about electricity, the discovery of electricity and an electric motor. Electric motor is that thing that you see uh, at the airport that moves your, the conveyor belt that brings your, uh, that brings your, your bag. Like it, it's yeah. actually uh, an, an electric motor. And of course that is the same system that is used in production. Mm. If you go to any production line, you will realize that uh, it's basically conveyor belts that are moving goods and those goods are being, uh, are, are, are being manufactured while they are, they are being moved by a conveyor belt. So the second industrial revolution gave us mass production mm. capabilities. Mm. Then the third industrial revolution is the electronic age. Electronics, um, uh, uh, we know about computers. A PC came about in the, in the 70s, but computers have been around for, for quite a bit, uh, but the way they used to fill the entire rooms. Mm. But they still couldn't do uh, the sort of things that we do with our phones, you know. And now we are in the fourth industrial revolution. So it's a progression, but uh, in many ways you can come to the fourth industrial revolution without having had participated in earlier revolutions. Prof, so you've just made mention of the fact that you can take part in the fourth industrial revolution without having taken part in the, the three that come before it. And a lot of people have this confusion with the third and the fourth industrial revolution. And um, they feel though they are different, but there are many similarities. Is this a true statement or um, do we need to get a better understanding of what artificial intelligence then is in this regard? Well, I can understand the confusion because uh, uh, the, 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 the third industrial revolution was about electronics mm. and, uh, and much of the technologies uh, of the fourth industrial revolution are electronic. So uh, there's that similarity. Now, uh, uh, let's take one example, automation. Automation has been around for a long time, for the past 60 years. If you went to industries, you will see automated automation happen. Now, what is the difference between the automation of the fourth industrial revolution and the automation of the third industrial revolution. The difference is intelligence. Okay. There is intelligence in, 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 in the automation process, which basically means while you could not speak to a machine in the third industrial revolution, you can now speak to a machine in the fourth industrial revolution and give it instructions. Okay. 
while the machines of the third industrial revolution required a human being to fix them, the machines of the fourth industrial revolution have the capabilities of fixing themselves. So the intelligence part is what differentiates the fourth industrial revolution from the third industrial revolution. One of the most important components of 4IR is artificial intelligence, or AI. AI refers to the ability of machines to perform functions intelligently in many ways, like a human would, or better. It can be found in everything from the ordinary, everyday experience of unlocking a smartphone using facial recognition, to the complex technology involved in self-driving cars. The quick replies your email platform offers, the adverts you see online, the personalization of your social media feeds, the smart device you use in your home, and the apps you use to bank, shop, and commute. They're all powered by AI. There's barely an industry that hasn't been affected by AI and hasn't had to incorporate its many functions in order to stay relevant. AI draws on techniques, skills, and knowledge from many fields, including computer science, information engineering, mathematics, psychology, linguistics, and philosophy, among others. In the world of work, AI is combined with machine learning, robotics, augmented and virtual reality, and the Internet of Things to change the way industries manufacture, market, and distribute their products and services. Let's then talk about the importance of artificial intelligence within the fourth industry. Well, I mean, uh, there are many other uh, uh, technologies of the fourth industrial revolution. Blockchain is another one. Internet of Things is another one. But artificial intelligence is the most important. Because you can have, um, you know, you can wire uh, a, a system or an object. You can have all sorts of, of data that you are gathering from, from the system. Without the intelligence to make sense of that data, then you are not going to succeed. So, therefore, Internet of Things cannot be fully realized without artificial intelligence. And we even know that uh, some of the weaknesses of blockchain technology are, able, are actually uh, handled using artificial intelligence. Now, what is this technology called artificial intelligence? It is basically a technology that makes machines intelligent. And there are many ways in which you can be able to do that. But the dominant way is to use data you collect data, you train your machine, just as we human beings become intelligent because of the data that we absorb from the environment. We observe things, and out of that observation, we actually become intelligent. So the technology that is overriding in the fourth industrial revolution is artificial intelligence. As AI becomes an increasing part of our everyday life, it's having a greater and greater effect on the work that we do, as well as how and where we do it. Jobs that were once considered critical have become obsolete, or at least they no longer need to be performed by a human. This trend will likely continue, and many jobs and activities that we take for granted today may not necessarily be part of the world of work tomorrow. Some of the positions that have been most severely affected by 4IR include jobs in transportation and storage, manufacturing and wholesale and retail. But 4IR is also paving the way for the creation of new jobs. In order for 4IR to continue to evolve, which it is, at a rapid pace, we need people to adapt, innovate and create. Robotics professionals, data scientists, app developers, Automation specialists and content curators, for example, are more important now than ever before. Keeping up with these changes demands a wide-ranging set of skills. The next generation of 4IR innovators need to question their reality just as creatively as the world's first industrial innovators did over 250 years ago. Is this you? If so, you need to be able to think critically and creatively. Be analytical in your approach. Stay on top of and adopt AI processes. Develop smart planning frameworks and work collaboratively with others. Can you speak on how this is changing things for us as a human resource and how we're going to be working? No, absolutely. I mean, you, you mentioned that it is quite scary. I remember when I was doing uh, standard D8. Now they call it grade 10. 
1987 to be specific. And our teacher, uh, Mr. Hatten, said, uh, uh, I'm going to make you watch a movie called The Terminator. <laughs> sure. And, uh, and uh, it, it was on Saturday. We brought the television screen, we brought uh, a video, uh, and we watched The Terminator. And then I went and watched The Terminator today. Then I realized that I missed quite a great deal of things. You know. uh, firstly, they talk about neural networks, which is really what artificial intelligence is all about. You know. At that point, I don't think anybody knew what neural network was in the room. You know. uh, but uh, nonetheless, we enjoyed uh, uh, the movie. But what has actually been something that uh, even then I realized was that the the, there is a danger in making machines intelligent. Okay. Who has the control switch? You know? And there obviously Skynet was uh, a rogue mm. software you know, mm. uh, in the Terminator. Uh, uh, but today, the same thing, self-driving cars. If it knocks off a person, who is responsible? Mm. And of course, this is not theoretical. We know that Uber's car actually went and knocked down a woman in Arizona and actually killed her. But there was nobody inside. It was driving itself. Who is responsible? You know? So there are dangers of artificial intelligence that we ought to understand. But there are also very good things that are coming out of artificial intelligence. Let's look at uh, its use in medicine, where it is effective, much, much more effective than a human doctor in diagnosing diseases. You know, uh, it is able to read medical images and therefore thrusting the whole field of radiology into question going forward because it is simply able to read medical images and make a diagnosis better than a human doctor. You know, so there are advantages and there are disadvantages. Now, if you go to production, people will say, but it is taking away the jobs. Mm. That is the bad side. But it is also making production much, much more efficient and ultimately making the, go the, the, the cost of goods and services much, much more affordable for all of us. And where in South Africa amid this flux? South Africa acknowledged the importance of 4IR many years ago and has been hard at work researching and investing in the opportunities it affords. A presidential commission on the fourth industrial revolution was established in 2019 and its report, which was published in 2020, offered seven recommendations for advancing 4IR in South Africa. These recommendations included investing in human capacity, building 4IR related infrastructure, creating platforms for citizen participation, establishing a creative 4IR institute, ensuring the protection of data, incentivizing 4IR industries and applications, and updating regulation. If combined and properly executed, these initiatives could have a material impact on the country's future. As, as, as people that want to form part of this revolution, what kind of skills then should we look at acquiring? I think uh, one, one of the things that I benefited from was what I called uh, getting educated in its totality. And we don't really do it that well in South Africa. Uh, we get, uh, we train engineers and they are very, very good engineers. But they understand very little of, uh, of other disciplines. Uh, I think it is important that those people who are doing um, uh, technical subjects also do human and social subjects. I also think it is important for those who are doing human and social subjects to also have a fair dose of technology. Because the future is really going to be the future of a human machine system. Now, what is the use of that? I'll give you an example. Uh, Apple has a, has, a, has a device called Siri. Siri is supposed to be able to understand you when you speak. Now, a designer of Siri must first and foremost be able to understand how to program must be able to understand how artificial intelligent um, algorithms actually are programmed and should be able to actually program uh, those, uh, uh, that device. But at the same time, such a person must also understand linguistics. Yes. Language, very, very important. Because it is a fusion 
of technology and language so that people can speak to that technology and it can be able to understand them. So it is important that such a computer scientist must have also done linguistics. And I can give you many, many, many other examples. Social networks. Uh, it is actually quite interesting that when uh, Mark Zuckerberg was uh, studying at, uh, at, at Harvard, his major was computer science and, uh, and psychology. We don't really have many people who are majoring in computer science and, and, and psychology in South Africa. Normally, if they're majoring in, 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 in computer science and something else, it will be mathematics, yes. you know. Now, the question is, a social network requires somebody who understands people, who understands society. And therefore, if you have not educated an individual to understand both, then you are going to be at the margins. So in answering your question, it is important that uh, uh, the people who are involved in the fourth industrial revolution understand mathematics, they understand science, but it is also very important that they understand human and they understand society. Prof, what would you say are some of the noticeable uh, milestones that um, South Africa has managed to achieve within the fourth industrial revolution? No, I think uh, the fourth industrial revolution commission report it's a big milestone that we have actually achieved. But if you go to our industries, you go to our banking industry, you go to our manufacturing industry, you will realize that uh, there is a fair degree of uh, fourth industrial revolution technology that is uh, infused uh, in the production. You know? I think there's more we can do in the educational space. I think there are some serious weaknesses as far as our ability to uh, to handle um, uh, to, 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 to handle mathematics, to handle um, science, we can do much more. Uh, I also think that um, uh, we can do more in terms of investment into the for our infrastructure, uh, the issues of uh, um, a, you know a connectivity is not as universally available to our people as it is supposed to be, you know. Uh, I think we can, uh, we can do more uh, with um, retraining of the existing uh, staff in our society uh, who have actually been, um, you know, trained in an era before the fourth industrial revolution and have to be retrained so that they are in line with what is happening in the fourth industrial revolution. We have different industries um, that are actually doing quite well within the fourth industrial revolution that are still struggling with um, being regulated within um, South Africa. Um, we've seen the financial sector and um, Bitcoin and how it's been working within um, um, the country or cryptocurrency and how they're struggling with regulating it. Do you feel um, South Africa is, is, is getting closer to bringing about um, adequate policies and regulation in, in, in instances like that? I hope so, but it will require our lawmakers to be scientifically and technologically educated. And that's a big weakness. We should not uh, uh, undermine that. It is a big weakness that uh, when you go to our parliaments, whether provincial or national, you realize that uh, there are very few people who actually understand technology. There are very few people who are trained uh, in the field of technology. If we are going to be able to, to deal with this issue of regulation, then we require people who are technologically adept. Just quite coincidentally, today, uh, in about um, 45 minutes, uh, we are going to be meeting uh, the uh, Director General of the World Health Organization uh, to release a report on the regulatory guidelines for the use of artificial intelligence in medicine. We need to do that in the country. Our parliament must look at all our laws and update them to be in line with the fourth industrial revolution and create new laws if um, they, they, they are no laws that are able to handle things. I'll give you an example. Now you have companies, uh, they're called platform companies. They operate in South Africa. Facebook is one of them. Uber is one of them. You know, um, you know Airbnb is, is one of them. You know. Do we have regulations to be able to handle such companies? Do we have uh, uh, tax laws that will be able to handle such companies? 
Those are the questions that we ought to answer. Absolutely. What then does the future hold? How will the world of work continue to evolve? And what will this evolution and revolution mean for the world we're creating? If we've learned anything in the years since 4IR became our lived reality, it's how to permanently suspend disbelief. Nothing is impossible anymore. The new world we wake up to every day is fact, not fiction, and how it proceeds is ours to create. Professor, in closing, um, what would your remarks be for anyone that, 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 that's watching, that wants to understand what they need to start looking at in terms of what the future of work would look like? What would your remarks for such people be? I think uh, the big thing is to learn, uh, to educate yourself, to understand this technology. You don't have to be an, an engineer to be able to understand this technology. And um, to be able to uh, to, to, you know, to be able to rediscover your intellect because this is an era where um, information is coming on um, a daily basis and if you do not um, adapt adaptively then you are going to be left behind. What we need to become deeply familiar with as we navigate 4IR is change. 4IR is transforming not only how we think about and interact with the world, but also, as Professor Marwala says, our very identity. We're being forced to interrogate our role in a complex system that intricately fuses the responsibilities of humans and machines. As it unfolds, we need to constantly question the innovations we drive, what their short, medium and long-term ramifications will likely be, and who is ethically accountable for their outcomes. And when new information becomes available, we need to evolve all over again. Throughout it all, we need to be curious, informed, adaptable and resilient. If we are, the long-term advantages of this fascinating era are ours for the taking. The University of Johannesburg the future reimagined.